بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله I'd like to first thank you all for allowing me to uh, break my fast um, I wasn't um, I thought we were just going to have a, you know, a date and come right in but mashallah my host made me two shawarma sandwiches and you know and I you know, I had to scarf that down real quick so <clears throat> so pardon me for starting a little bit uh, late but we spoke today in the khutbah how many people were there in the khutbah alhamdulillah so we spoke today about the in the khutbah about recommitting ourselves to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, I thought it, uh, I've, I've been thinking for a while now about uh, one of the surahs in uh, Juz Amma that we recite often, and it's Surah Al Ma'un. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al ala Don't they con contemplate and ponder the Quran very deeply, or is it that some hearts have locked themselves out? And we will talk about anything and everything of, uh, under the sun but very seldom do we actually get together to discuss reflections on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in uh, the spirit of Ramadan in the spirit of Shawwal which is the reclamation of Ramadan uh, and the recommitment to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I wanted to uh, reflect with you tonight about some of the meanings of Surah Al Ma'un right? uh, it's such a beautiful surah and it's one of these surahs that are recited often but are skipped over in terms of their implication and uh, really setting a, a vision for a community I think uh, the tafsir we're not really going to get into tafsir we're just going to do tadabbur tonight uh, which is reflection on the book of Allah and any <clears throat> reflection just um, by rule of thumb any reflection on any surah in the Quran must begin with the surah before it right and must lead to the surah after it. There is a cohesion in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among all of the surahs. All of the surahs are strung together like pearls on a, on a necklace, right? And there's no pearl that stands on its own. And what beautifies all of these pearls is that you see them in a string, right? It's not just one pearl, but you see them in a, in a, in a, in a string. So they're strung together. And the interweaving of the surahs of the Qur'an is part of the beauty and the majesty of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there is a uh, deliberate <clears throat> will behind the arrangement of the Qur'an. Um, some orientalists would say that the Qur'an is a book that has 114 chapters. All of these chapters were sort of blasted up into a, an explosion and they and wherever they fell is how the Quran was arranged, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, that He guides many with this book and He misguides many with this book, right? So, yes, it does seem to the unstudied eye as random, right? As random. But to a person who sits and reflects and a person who comes to the Quran with a sound heart, there's nothing, there's nothing random about the arrangement of the surahs, nor the arrangement of the verses in the surahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears, He swears, فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ I swear by the mawaqa'i nujum, which on one level is the constellations of the stars. The mawaqa'i nujum, where the stars fall in the skies. Right, that there's a that there's an order to the cosmos, and you go out, and a person can look at the 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 night firmament and say, "Wow, amazing!" Right, and be totally illiterate but captivated at the same time. But the way that the astronomer reads the skies is utterly different because he sees that there is an order and there is a pattern and there is a consistency in the in the map of the skies. And they would actually take these constellations and use them to guide themselves. The, 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 the mariners would guide themselves uh, on a pitch black night, you know, toward where they're going in the seas. So a studied eye will read the star, star, stars in a different way. But that is not the intended meaning of the verse, according to the Mufassirun. 
that I, Allah is swearing by the constellations of the stars, right? Although it is a reading, but the primary reading of this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the mawaqa and nujum, the places where the nujum fall, and what are the nujum? They are the ayat in the book of Allah. The placement of the ayat in the book of Allah and the placement of the surahs in the book of Allah, that is all tawqifi from the Prophet ﷺ. He is the one who would have his scribes, 23 scribes, would follow, would follow, they would shit, take shifts. Some of them would follow him, there would be five at a time or two at a time or at least one at a time because they don't know when the verses will come down upon the Prophet ﷺ. So they're always there ready to write down immediately. And when the verses come, and they usually came in chunks of five, <clears throat> in, in passages of five, excerpts of five verses at a time, right? They usually came to the Prophet of five at a time, right? اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من عرق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Usually they would come in five. And when they would come, he would tell his scribes to, he would recite it to his scribes, and he would tell them to place this passage in such and such a surah after such and such verses. So that all came from the Prophet ﷺ. And every year he would sit with his scribes and review everything that they had written. They would write, they would, they would read to him everything they had written and he would have the opportunity to correct them if there was any correction needed. Right? So that all came from the Prophet ﷺ. So if we're going to speak about Surah Al-Ma'un tonight, then we have to look at Surah Quraysh, right? <clears throat> we have to look at Surat Quraysh. And if we're going to look at Surat Ma'un tonight, we have to look at Surat Al Kawthar, right? Quraysh, Ma'un, Kawthar, right? And we're not going to look at Surat Quraysh or Kawthar in depth because we don't have very much time, you know. Uh, unfortunately, there was Shawarma involved in the process tonight that, that is going to take a little bit of the time that we, have, we could have had. You can blame Yusuf for that. Blame his, blame his wife for that. May Allah bless your wife. Allah bless her. Alhamdulillah. And I, I'm saying that experientially, man. I, I, you guys can only vicariously appreciate what that shawarma tasted like. But we want to just mention one thing about Quraysh and one thing about Kawthar. Okay? And Imam Suyuti in his book, Asrar Tartib Surah Al-Qur'an, The Secrets of the Arrangements of the Surahs of the Qur'an, it's a very short book, about 90 pages, he mentions that the way one surah ends will be related to the way another surah begins. And the way one surah begins will relate to how it itself ends. And the way it ends will relate to how the next surah begins. Right? <clears throat> so we see the last ayah of Surah Quraysh, we relate to the first ayah of Surah Al-Ma'un, right? And the uh, the uh, um, the last verse of Surah Al-Ma'un will relate to what? The first surah of Surah Al, the first ayah of Surah Al Kawthar, right? Okay. So, what is the last ayah of Surah Quraysh? فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الذي أطعمهم من جوع وآمنهم من خوف. So let them worship the Lord of this house, the one who gave them to eat and quenched their hunger. Right? Not quenched. I'm sorry. They, uh, gave them to eat and quelled their hunger, and gave them security from everything that they could possibly fear. So let them worship the Lord of this house, who quelled their hunger, right, by feeding them, feeding them to quell their hunger, and gave them security from everything that they could possibly fear. Okay? That's the last ayah of Surah Quraysh. <clears throat> and the first ayah of Surah Al-Ma'un, right, أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينَ Did you, have you considered the one who has used this religion to forge a lie? And then that's going to lead us to a certain theme that's going to connect back to Surah Quraysh. And then the last verse of Surah Al-Ma'un, we're just talking about the structure now, not getting into the content, but the structure. The last verse of Surah Al-Ma'un is what? 
وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَاعُونَ And they, what? They prevent even neighborly deeds. So do you see how the first verse of Surah Al-Ma'un relates to the last verse of Surah Al-Ma'un? Have you not considered the one who lies using the religion? Such people even refuse neighborly deeds. So the first and the last of Surah Al-Ma'un, they relate, right? And then they refuse neighborly de needs. And then we have what? Inna al kawthar. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't refuse neighborly deeds neighborly needs. He didn't refuse those neighborly needs. And so as a result, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him with? He blessed him with the fount of kawthar. And so in Surah Al Quraysh, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, you know, we have the mention of food. And in Surah Al Kawthar, we have what? The mention of drink. And Surah Al Ma'un, which is neighborly needs, right, is between food and drink. You see? So let's get into the meal now. Let's get into the meat. Huh? Of Surah Al Ma'un. You guys ready? That's just, a, that's just introducing it from a structural perspective, right? All right. So let's get into Surah Al Ma'un. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this blessed surah, and I'd like us all to recite it together before we get into it verse by verse. Ara'ayta alladhi yukadibu bintin. A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ara'ayta alladhi yukadibu bintin. فذلك الذي يدعو اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين فويل للمصلين الذين هم عن صلاتهم ساهون الذين هم يراؤون ويمنعون الماعون <coughs> So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah by Addressing his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Have you seen the one who lies using the religion? He lies using the religion right? There's two meanings to this He lies He lies using the religion Or He lies He, he, he uh, uh, rejects the religion Right? He rejects the religion, or he lies using the religion. If 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 it relates to the one who rejects religion, then who are those people? Who's being? Who is the Allah asking the Prophet ﷺ to consider? Huh? Those who reject the religion. Those who are they? In the Quranic archetype for them is who? The Quraysh, the Kufar, basically. In the Quranic archetype, which is much like we have the Kufar, the Munafiqun, and the Mu'minun. Right, in Surah Al-Baqarah. So the kuffar, right? And if we're talking about the one, those who use the religion to perpetuate a lie, then we're talking about what? <clears throat> the munafiqun, right? So this is, a, what is to follow then, is going to be a, a characterization of either the kuffar or the munafiqun, right? Or both, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the Prophet sallallahu not in need of any answer, but this is a rhetorical way of creating a, an interest in what is to follow. Like I ask you, for example, have you ever considered X, Y, Z? Hmm. No, I've never. But, but now, you, now you got me curious, right? So what, what is your take on X, Y, and Z? Right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the Prophet وسلم, enlivening in us a desire to know who are those who reject faith or who are those who use the religion to perpetuate their own lies. And why would we be interested? Because we do not want to be among them. We want to make sure <clears throat> that whoever is going to be described, that that description does not apply to me. Right? And that's why when Allah asked that question, He asked that question in order for us to say, to, to in the way awakening, the, awaken this desire in us to be among those who are not characterized in the verses to come. Right? الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَلَا يَحُدُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ 
I'll mention them both together and then I'll go to the first one. So that is the person who repels the orphan. Such is the person who repels the orphan and does not encourage the feeding of the indigent does not encourage the feeding of the poor and the indigent. Right? Okay. And now that's so the description is how many what, what how many descriptions do we have for those who use the religion as a lie or reject the faith? How many descriptions? Huh? Two. <clears throat> فَوَيْنُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ the, the, the theme shifted, right? فَوَيْنُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ So woe to those who... Let me translate the whole thing, right? So we get a sense. أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينَ Have you considered the one who rejects the religion or uses the religion to perpetuate a lie? فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِينَ Such is the person who repels the orphan. وَلَا يَحُدُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ And he does not encourage the feeding of the indigent. فَوَيْنُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ So woe to those who pray. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَهُونَ Who are completely negligent of the intent of their prayers. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ Who, whatever they do, they do it in order to be seen by others. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ And even refuse neighborly needs. Okay? And that's the rough rendition of the surah. <clears throat> so the Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barakat Sayyid Muhammad Okay, we got Someone came to the rescue here Jazakum Allah khair Alhamdulillah So how many descriptions do we have for those who use the religion to perpetuate a lie or those who reject the faith? Two. Those who what? They repel the orphan and they do not encourage the feeding of the indigent. Well, that's interesting. Those who reject the faith are being described as repelling orphans and not feeding, not encouraging the feeding of the poor. Like that's their characteristic? Like that's their characteristic? <laughs> I mean, wait a minute, we're talking about the kuffar here, <clears throat> or we're talking about the munafiqun here, the, the, the disbelievers or the hypocrites, and they're being described in this way. They're characterized in this way. Like, this is the, this is the suspense that the first verse is, the first verse is creating the suspense, and then these are the two descriptions, it rather seems, if you don't mind me saying, right, and forbid, forgive me for saying, a rather anticlimactic, right? With all that we know in the sira about the kuffar and the munafikun. I mean, they, they were, the munafikun, 300 of them left the battlefield at Uhud. And here they're being characterized as not taking care of the orphan. <clears throat> right? The kuffar... 15 assassination attempts on the Prophet's life from the hands of a kafir, right? And there's not, there's not a, yeah, I mean, and, and their characteristic, their, the, you know, the, their shining characteristic is that they don't feed the indigent, they don't encourage that the poor people be fed. So what's going on? <clears throat> well, what's going on here? Obviously, these are not the only two characteristics of these folks, right? These folks, have, they have a, they got a, lo, a good long list of characteristics if you want to write them all down. Obviously, right? But why these two? And why only these two being mentioned in the surah? <clears throat> the fact that I'm reacting this way means that I've missed the point. 
the fact that I'm even reacting this way and asking, and I'm saying anticlimactic, and some of you might even agree with me, means that we're, we've missed the point, right? We've missed the point. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates this suspense in the first verse, there's nothing anticlimactic that comes after divine suspense. That this is the climax. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us in a beautiful rhetorical way <clears throat> something that would not cross the mind of anyone at his time, the Prophet's time, sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam, as being the two most egregious crimes against God. But if you look at it, if you look at it, taking care of the orphan and feeding the indigent, there are, there are verses after verses after verses throughout the Qur'an about that. And let's take the first one. فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ Such is the one who repels the orphan. And let's go back to the very first revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu after Surah after Iqra, <coughs> which were after the, the six months of there being a lull in the revelation, silence in the skies, right? Silence in the skies for six months. What's that first surah that comes to the Prophet Sallallahu after that as a consolation? And it is considered Surah Muhammad. Right, the surah of the of the consolation of the Prophet What is it? Wadduha, wallayli ida saja, ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala, wala la khiratu khayrun laka min alula, wala sawfa yu'atika rabbuka fatharda, alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa, wa wajidaka dhalan fahada, wa wajidaka a'ilan fa'agna. Stop. Until now, all of Surah Iqra, and, and, and everything here in Surah Al-Duha has been descriptive about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has not had any legal import. The first injunction given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu of any legal import that has to do with his sharia comes in the next verse. And what's that verse? فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقَرْ so as for the orphan, do not repel him. That's the very first thing the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to do in, in terms of a shar'i hukum, a ruling that will come down, is not to repel the orphan, because you once were an orphan. You once were an orphan, right? Allah SWT is reminding him, أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا فَأَوَى Did we not find you an orphan? And so, we, and, and, and he gave you shelter. <clears throat> right? Did he not find you an orphan and so he gave you shelter? This is what he's reminded. And so the first injunction comes with that first nickname that the Prophet ﷺ has for himself. The first Quranic nickname for the Prophet ﷺ is what? Yatim. Yatim. The first Quranic nickname. The first nickname that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him in the revelation of the, in the Quran is Yatim. The orphan. Did he not find you an orphan? And the Prophet has 3,000 names. 3,000 names. The very first name that was revealed in the book of Allah for the Prophet is Yatim. Did we not find you Yatiman? And one of the, one of the, the, the principles in language, and especially in the Arabic language, is the more names something has, the greater status it has, the greater its status, the greater its stature, right? The more names it has, right? So, for example, you have, <coughs> you have Asad, what's Asad? Lion, right? And you have Laith, what's Laith? Lion. Hamza, Lion. Usama, Lion, right? Haytham, Lion. Ghabamfar, lion, right? And these are all aspects of the lion, but the lion is the king of the jungle, so he's going to have all these names, right? What is a yatim? Yatim is the one who has lost a father. Aji is the one who has lost a mother. Latim is the one who has lost both father and mother. 
you've got three different words for orphans. And this is already in the Arabic language before the Prophet Sallallahu is born. It's already there in the Arabic language, which means what? Which means what? That the orphan had status in the eyes of people. That there was status in the eyes of people that they would distinguish, right? That you have your own identity depending on your circumstance, right? So the orphan had status in the eyes of people in that time. And so this is, so, so to, to deny the orphan is one of the, is, is a sign that you have rejected faith itself. To deny the orphan <clears throat> is a sign that you use the religion to perpetuate a lie. To reject an orphan is the rejection of one of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu who is the patron of the orphans. It's as though you have the Prophet himself وسلم, and you tell him, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not interested in your companionship. Because Ana wa kafirul yatimi kahatain. I and the caretaker of the orphan were just like this. We were just like this. Kahatain. <clears throat> and he did not specify, he did not qualify that by saying kahataini fil jannah. He didn't say like these two in Jannah, but we are like this, these two, here and there. And these two, what is the difference? What, 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 is, what, is, what is the meaning of these two? These two in proximity and these two in rank. In closeness with the Prophet we have the companionship of Rasulullah by taking care of the orphan. And in rank, we rank right under the Prophet the one who? is the caretaker of the orphan. Not the scholar, not the wali so-and-so, not, the, not to downplay any of that, but look at what the Prophet ﷺ is saying, which means it's accessible to any one of us. That this is accessible to any one of us. And there is a hierarchy in terms of knowledge. Are they equal, those who know and those who don't know? Ask those who know, if you do not know, right? Those who know have a rank above us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, that you, you give people their, their proper rank among yourselves, right? Give people the, the deference that is due to them based on their rank above you, right? So we're not knocking that. But there are certain aspects of this deen and most of this deen, most of this deen, is related to action, is related to work and deeds. And this is accessible to anyone who is illiterate or who has been raised in a family of scholarships for, for generations. It's, a, it's accessible to everyone across the board. So to take care of the orphan, and this is in many different degrees, either to adopt, or to be a foster parent, or if you cannot do that, to support financially, and every time you see an orphan, to be there for them emotionally, even to caress their heads, and to support them, and to give them encouragement and hope. All of this, all of this, is weighed heavily in the balance in the Day of Judgment. It's as though you were taking care of the Prophet himself وسلم, when he was but an orphan. وسلم. So we cannot underestimate this. This is the first of their qualities is that they repel the orphan. They repel the orphan. And in the world today, there are 153 million orphans. 153 million orphans, 15% of whom have neither a father nor a mother. 153 million orphans, whom if you gathered them all together in one place, they would be the ninth greatest nation after Bangladesh. They would form the ninth greatest nation after Bangladesh. Okay a whole country of orphans.
And so part of فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ such as the one who repels the orphans, part of that is an indictment against us as Muslims in how we have neglected the care of orphans. And this is not something we talk about enough. This is not something we talk about on, on the pulpit on Fridays. This is not something that we, it's not part of our ethos to talk about this. And it's all, and, and it can, and it's almost like a taboo if someone knows that you are actually adopted an orphan. It's, like, it's almost, like, almost like a taboo. It's like an unspoken taboo. How do we take a prophetic injunction? How do we take a divine command and turn it into a taboo, a social taboo, that I'm raising an orphan in my home? The Ummah, the same Ummah, whose prophet commanded the care of the orphans, and said that you have the rank with me like this, if you take care of the orphans. This same Ummah considers it haram to adopt an orphan. Like if you mention the word adoption, the next word that rings across our minds is what? Haram. How many times have we put those two words in a sentence together, or heard those two words in a sentence together, and never questioned it? Haram. Adoption is haram. Adoption is haram? Can you get a clue? Adoption is haram. When our Prophet وسلم, adopted a son, he himself adopted Zayd ibn, ibn Haritha. He himself took care of Ali ibn Abi Talib and raised him. He himself took care of Anas ibn Malik and raised him. He himself went on the day of Mu'ta, when he was giving his khutbah on, 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 the, on the pulpit, he said, Ja'far has fallen. Ja'far, his, his cousin, the, the, the brother of Sayyidina Ali alayhi salam, Ja'far is slain. And he, he descends from the pulpit and he goes to the house of Asma bin Sa'amaysh. Bin Asma bin Sa'amaysh. And he, sa and he enters that house and those children come out to him. And he grabs each one of these children and embraces them and begins to weep. And Asma says, Ya Rasulullah, what has happened to Sayyidina Ja'far? And he says, he has fallen. And where is the battle of Mu'ta? All the way there in Jordan, present day Jordan. And she, and she begins, he, re he reads her state. And he says, you fear poverty after Ja'far? He said, I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul, Ana waliyuhum fi dunya wal akhirah. I am their caretaker in this world and the next. The one who took care of the orphans. The orphan who took care of orphans. So how many orphans is he taking care of? How many people is he raising without, their, without the care of their parents? Ali was raised by the Prophet ﷺ in his home, not in the home of Abu Talib. He was raised by the Prophet ﷺ. How many children did he raise? And, and stepchildren did he raise? And yet we are going to turn around and say that adoption is haram. I just want you to consider a story. Consider a woman who comes forth to a community after having birthed her daughter. And the man, the father, dies, right, before the child is born. Okay? The father died while the child was still in the womb of her mother. She brings this girl to the community. And the community fight her over who is going to take care of her. All of the men of the community fight with one another over who is going to take care of this little girl. And they have a village elder. They have a village elder. This village elder himself does not have children. He's old, but his wife is barren. She cannot produce children. This village elder is desperate to have a child. And this is an opportunity. 
where he can actually take care of this child. But all of the men of his community fight him to take care of this child. They fight against their own village elder, against their old tribal chief leader, that no, we are going to take it. Each one of these men wants to take care of that girl for, her, for himself. And they don't come from, that girl does not come from a wealthy family. There's no benefit in it. And I'm painting this picture for you. And they almost go to blows over it. Does this story sound any bit familiar to you? What if I told you that village elder was Zakaria, alayhi salam? And what if I told you that little girl was Maryam, alayhi salam? Now we know the story in retrospect. Of course, of course they would fight over Maryam. It's Maryam. Like, like they know who Maryam is. They have no idea who Maryam is. And they are fighting whom? A prophet. Saying what? Saying what? That if it be the will of Allah, then Allah will decree in your favor. These are the men that Zakaria, whom Zakaria raised with this ethic and with this, with, with this, this certainty in their faith and with the, the, the feeling of responsibility toward those who need to be taken care of. Like where did they get their character from? If not from the embodiment of, of character in, that they saw in Zakaria alayhi salam. He raised them to think like this. He raised them to, to, to be who they were. And they're fighting him, saying that if it be the will of Allah, then Allah will decree in your favor. And compare that to a friend of mine named Mark, who at the age of 30 is able to track down his father, whom he had never seen a day in his life. And he calls him and he says, my name is Mark. And he gave him his last name and the man knew that they had the same last name. And he said, I don't want anything from you. I'm not calling you because I need anything from you. I'm not calling you because I'm bitter. I'm not calling you for anything. I just want to know you. I just want to meet you. And I'll let the past be the past. I don't even need to bring up anything in the past. It would just be an honor for me to meet the man who brought me into the world. And that man said to him, don't ever call this number again. Now that is not an isolated story. That is commonplace in this country. And you have people in this country, you have Muslims in this country who are being raised by Christians who are in the foster care system. Muslims in this country being raised outside of Islam, totally taken out, out of Islam. Why? Because adoption is haram. You have Muslim families, Muslim couples who cannot have children because either the man is sterile or the woman is barren. And so they will, they will refuse to adopt the child. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through some wisdom, through some decree, there's a wisdom in every single situation. But there is a need on the other side that can be, can be fulfilled. And everyone has their circumstance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing that I want, would like to say here is that we have a responsibility toward the orphan. Whether we adopt them, and if our life circumstance does not allow that, then we, then we uh, uh, rally for them or we campaign for them in some way. And if we cannot do that, then at least we adopt an orphan financially. And Islamic Relief and Penny Appeal, they have adopt an orphan program. Right? You don't even have to think about it. A dollar a day takes care of all of the orphans' needs from food and drink and shelter and schooling and all of that, just one dollar a day. But there is an imperative that is upon all of our necks to do something with respect to the life of some orphan somewhere in the world. And this is what we are being called upon to do in Surat Al-Ma'un. You know who's got this down pat? 
for for decades now there has been the 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 Christian adoption movement in this country what is known as the Christian adoption movement in this country from Protestants and evangelicals in the Bible belt and the reason for that is not because of the 29 in injunctions in the Old Testament and the New Testament with respect to taking care of orphans it's not that and it's not because every Sunday this is what the preacher is saying every single Sunday shoving down this message of taking care of the orphans down people's throats it's not because of that it's driven by by uh, religious politics basically that because of their stance their staunch stance as pro-lifers they will not allow for abortion to happen in their communities and if anyone has a child who cannot take care of that child they compete with one another in order to take care of that child they'll bring them to the church and they will be placed in the in a family there in that church statistically speaking it's off the charts and there are Muslims who are in that it's off the charts my my contention is that if this is not a message that is being shoved down their throats every Sunday and if this is not what they are reading in their Bibles in their Bible study and it's just related just motivated by politics what would those statistics be if Jesus himself had adopted children and that was used as an example like what if what if Jesus had adopted two or three children and that was used as an example how many more Christians would have adopted and yet our prophet adopted children and the only thing that was considered haram was that he named him Zayd ibn Muhammad that was that the verse came down in order to correct that do not call them after your names, but call them after their father's names. That's the only thing about adoption that, that, that it's considered haram. As well as having a child that, you know, that, that, that once the child reaches the age of puberty, if there wasn't nursing that was done, that's an issue as well. Right? That's an issue as well. Right? It becomes an issue. And then the child will have to, the, the, the woman would have to wear hijab in the house. And the man cannot be alone in the, in the room with the, that, that's, that's an issue. Yes, granted. Right? But there, but there are ways around that. There are ways around that. And we are the ones who follow, our prophet set the example of taking care of the orphans. Right? So this is something that we have to, we absolutely have to act on. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and they do not encourage the feeding of the indigent and the poor, the downtrodden. They don't, they, don't, they don't encourage that, right? Now, of course, they're not going to encourage that if they're repelling the orphan themselves and, and, and not allowing the orphan access to the orphan's own wealth. They are miserly with the orphan regarding the orphan's wealth. Then how are they going to encourage others to give to the poor? Right? These these go ahead. They don't they don't encourage one another to give to the to feed to, to feed the poor. Well, they do not Allah ta'am al miskin, right? Ta'am al miskin, and the ta'am is mentioned in Surah Quraysh before that. Allah the ta'amahum min jua, the one who fed them to quell their pangs of hunger, a hunger, the one who fed them to quell their pangs of hunger. What do they do now? They refuse to quell the hunger of the poor. Do you see the connection between these surahs? Right? So woe to those who pray. <laughs> it's epic, man. It's epic. This surah is so epic. So woe to those who pray. Huh? You know, like, like just imagine, the, <laughs> just imagine the Imam in the first rakah, right? In the first rakah.
<laughs> just woe to those who pray. Allah Akbar, you go into the core. Whoa, yeah, that's like <laughs> woe, W O E, right? Yeah. Like woe to those who pray. So Allah SWT again, like midway through the surah, again rhetorically, the, the rhetorical impact of that is 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 uh, it awakens us again. Woe to those who pray. Who's being who is reciting this? Who's receiving this? The Sahaba are receiving this from the Prophet. I mean it's satirical. Allah SWT is a divine satire here, right? And who's who's receiving it? It's those who pray. Right? Is those who pray. Now it's talking about the munafiqun and about us as well. Like about the those those possessed of faith and those who are hypocritical in that faith. Right? Now it extends. Like, so it went from kuffar and munafiqun to munafiqun and mu'minun. <laughs> right? There's a shift, right? There's a shift in the in the in the in the, in the verse, right? In the passage. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Right? And the reason that I'm saying the mu'minun is because the mu'minun are not immune to the next couple of descriptions. We are not immune to it. Right? The, the, those possessed of faith are not safe from the next couple of descriptions. Although the next couple of descriptions apply rightly to the munafiqun. They also apply... The, 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 the line is very thin though. And how many of the mu'minun could easily fall into nifaq? فَوَيْلٌ right? musallin. Woe to those who pray. Right? Woe to those who pray. And wail is woe, like it's, a, like it's a word of condemnation or a curse. Right? But it's also a valley specific in hell. It's a, it's a specific valley in hell called wail. That these people, they will, that's where they will be. Wailun lil musalli. So wail is for them. Wail is for those who pray. Right? Wail is for those who pray. For wailun lil musalli. Alladina hum an salatihim sahun. Those who are neglectful regarding their prayers. What does that mean? What does that mean? And they said, first of all, they said, Alhamdulillah, الذي قال عن صلاتهم وما قال في صلاتهم. Right? Glory be to the one who said they are neglectful regarding their prayers and not neglectful in their prayers. And there's a big difference between an and fi here. If it was fi, then we'd all be in trouble. Right? Neglectful in their prayers. Forgetful in their prayers. Sahun. Right? In their prayers, they're forgetting. Like you don't know, like like you know, you, you're standing. Allahu Akbar. Tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa taibat wa salam alaikum. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin al rahman al rahim. Where are you? <laughs> where are you? Like where are you? Seriously, you know, you don't even know what the Imam recited in the first or second rakah, and you know that you that he recited a, a verse that you the, a surah that you've memorized, right? It's like it's like. Oh, what did the khatib talk about today? Oh, it was a great khutbah, man. It was a re what did he talk about? Um, uh, um, were you there or not? <laughs> right? So wake up, right? الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ and not فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ So عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ They're neglectful regarding what? They're neglectful regarding their prayers. But does that mean that they're skipping prayers? It doesn't mean that they're skipping prayers. It does not mean that they're skipping prayers. They're praying. It does not mean that they're skipping prayers. Because that, would, that wouldn't make really much sense in the verse, right? In the, in the passage, it wouldn't make sense. That we're talking about certain characteristics, the orphan, the indigent, and then woe to those who skip their prayers. That's, there, there's, a, there's a disconnect there, right? So what are they neglectful really about regarding their prayers? Huh? Say again. They delay the prayer. That's still there's still a disconnect there, right? They are regard they are neglectful regarding the entire purpose behind their prayers. They are neglectful regarding al-gharad min al-salah, right? 
the, 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 the whole reason that they're praying in the first place. They're neglectful regarding what the prayer, the whole essence of the prayer. And what is the essence of the prayer? You look throughout the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where do you find salah that is not followed up by what? Zakah. Where do you find salah where it's not followed up by zakah? Hmm? Yeah. And the salah, inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar as well. That prayer uh, forbids uh, vile deeds and, uh, and, and iniquity, right? So you'll find, you'll find salah mentioned by itself. But it's, it's, but salah and zakah, whenever you read salah, you're expecting zakah. Why is that? Because they're, they're repeated so often together that the, that the, the proof of your prayer is in your charity. Right? The proof of your we put our money where our mouth is, right? And the prayer is where our mouth is, right? And so well, the money the money then comes after that to purify ourselves, right? That oh, that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we rid ourselves of our attachments, right? And that attachment first and foremost comes through money, through the materials, through material wealth, right? For Wailun an salatihim sahun, right? an salatihim sahun. The the the, the manifestation of Salah comes in the Zakah. And if you look, there's something very powerful in Arabic etymology that it, it proves to me that this language was, a, was divine. It just shows it. You have one word, under one word you have many concepts that, re, that are related to that one root. Like the word jama'ah, right? What does jama'ah mean? <coughs> he gathered or he collected. Okay? Some other words related are what? Jum'ah, Friday, the day of gathering and collecting. Jami'ah, the university that collects students and teachers. Mujtama, a society that collects all of the people in the society. Ijma, a, a consensus that collects together the opinion of scholars. Right? Uh, Jami'ah, a mosque that collects together the worshippers. So do you see how jama'ah comes in the, 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 to collect or to gather, that it's related to all of those cognates of that derivative, of, of that word, of that root, right? All of those words are related to those three letters. But the opposite is also true in the Arabic language, where you have a concept that is going to gather together similar words that are unrelated in their roots, that are not related in their roots. So you have words that are not related in their roots, that all come together under an umbrella concept. So if you look, for example, follow me, you have the word zakah. Zakah. And zakah means charity. Right? And it also means what? Purification. Okay? Purification. You have the word sadaqa. And sadaqa means what? Charity. And it's related to what? Sidq. Truthfulness. So you have purification and truthfulness. And then you have the word infaq, which means spending out. Spending of your money. And that is related to what? Nifaq. Hypocrisy. So you have pure the purification, right? Tazkiyah, purification. You have what? Sidq, truthfulness. And then you also have hypocrisy. Purification, truthfulness, hypocrisy. And it all relates to what? To spending your money. So this concept, this overarching concept in Arabic language of spending out and of charity, what does it bring together? It brings together zakaya. It brings together what? Zakaya and sadaqa and nafaqa. Three totally unrelated roots, but they're related through charity. And each one of them is telling us something about the reality of the nafs. And salah is what leads to all of that. 
and, 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 and then this is related, then this is, this is manifested, then it's represented in the Prophet's teachings himself. For he said, Al infaq, he said, Al iman bila infaq nifaq. Look at him playing with, the, playing with the words. Look at how the Prophet is playing with the words. Al iman bila infaq nifaq. Do you see how the Prophet is playing with the words? Yeah? You see that iman without any spending is hypocrisy. Iman without any spending is hypocrisy. And the play on words is that infaq is related to nifaq. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ So woe to those who pray. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Who are neglectful about the entire purpose of their prayer. What it's supposed to lead us to. What it is, how it is supposed to manifest in our actions. And, and the proof of that prayer, ultimately, is in the service of others. And we're not just talking about monetary but we're talking about zakat. Zakat is to enrich the life of someone else through any act of charity, even if it's a smile. At-tabassumu fi wajhi akhika sadaqa. Smiling in the face of your brother is charity. So salah is, salah is the root. Is all of that, the charity emerges from the salah. All of the, the acts of service and sacrifice and, and giving and spending and, and, and care and concern and empathy, all of that comes out of sound salah. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ But when they do good deeds, when they do works of sacrifice and charity, they do it what? To be seen of other men. To be seen of other men. So we're, this is a characteristic of the hypocrites, right? But, but every verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealed to whom? Was revealed to whom? It was revealed to you and to you and to me and to you and to you through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealed to us personally through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This is how we transact with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a verse comes down and says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ Those who do righteous works in order to be seen by others. Our reaction to that is not to say, that guy over there. <laughs> that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. That one, that. Way that that girl I met, you know, three weeks ago. That's what, yeah, yeah. That sounds like her, <laughs> right? It relates to us personally. And the dino whom you raun, like, am I am I safe from that? Am I safe from that? Uh, do I know that all of my acts are are solely and sincerely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and for His good pleasure? That that verse relates to me specifically. And the dino whom you raun, wajmnaun al maun, and they and they refuse even neighborly deeds. Now look at these two together. Look at these two together. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe to those who pray and are neglectful regarding the intent of their prayer, the purpose in their prayer, the essence of their prayer. الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ Those who do good to be seen by others. They do good to be seen by others. And they refuse to give the neighborly deeds. Those who do good to be seen by others should do good to be seen by whom? Allah alone. And those who refuse neighborly needs are refusing who? Whom? They're refusing whom? Those neighborly needs. They're, they're refusing who? Are, who whom are they refusing? They're not refusing Allah. You can't give Allah to refuse Him. Huh? The ones in need. So you have the khaliq and the khalq. You have the creator and the creation here. That they, that what, that, that they transact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ways to be seen by other men. 
and they transact with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by denying them their rights. Okay, so there's, a, there's, there's an interesting thing going on here because those who are denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or no, let's say, let's say that the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our deeds is that we hide them and we veil them from everyone else and we do it specifically for solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then that which belongs to everyone else we are refusing. So it's as though we take what belongs to Allah and we give it to the creation. And we take what belongs to the creation and we deny it for ourselves. That's what's going There's like a ring here in, this, in this la these last two verses. That those who are praying, right? Totally neglectful of why they're praying. And whatever they do, they do it in order to have their reputations go forward for them. All of those deeds belong to Allah. The intent here, the intention here should be solely for Allah, not for other people. But when it comes to other people, so, so they'll take that which belongs to Allah and they'll do it for others. But when it comes to what rightfully belongs to others, they'll keep for themselves. And this is how the surah ends. وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ And look at these two words. يَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ Everyone say, يَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ Does that sound, 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 does that sound related, huh? That sounds related too, huh? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings these words together. يَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ What's the root of the first word, يَمْنَعُونَ? What's the root there? ميم نون عين الماعون ميم عين نون right? ميم نون عين ميم عين نون Right? There's, 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 this, there's this relationship, right? There's this relationship that Razi calls in his, uh, in the introduction to his tafsir, he calls it al ishtiqaqul akbar. He says that every word in the Arabic language that's three letters has six combinations possibly. And each one of these combinations are related to one another. Each one of these combinations, or each one of these combinations, these six possible com com combinations, there's not going to be more than six, right? Where you have three letters, right? You have, like, he'll give the, the example of Malik Yawmiddin, right? Malaka. He says you have Malaka and Makala. You have Kalima and Kamula. And you have Lakama and Lamaka, right? There, so there's six. There's six. So Mana'a and Ma'ana. And basically, these six, they, they, rela they relate to each other, right? There's meanings that are interwoven among them that tie the roots together. So what is the connection between mana'a and ma'ana? Between prevention and neighborly needs. These come from the same word. Prevention and neighborly needs. What is the language, what is the, what is the language itself telling us? about neighborly needs. That neighborly needs should not be prevented. And that's just coming to us from the language itself, not from any prophetic guidance and not from any divine injunction. The language itself is telling us that when you have neighborly needs, they are not to be prevented. Hmm? But that it is in the nature of the human being to prevent them. It is in the nature of the human being to prevent even neighborly needs. Like he, wants, he wants my drill bit again. You know, he wants to borrow my lawnmower again. Right? The last time he gave me a lawnmower back, you know. <laughs> the last time I got my drill back, I didn't get my drill bits back right in time like when I needed it. I had to, you know, like this is, this is the, this is what we have to deal with, with our neighbors, right? But even their neighborly needs, they, they prevent them. So these are the people who you kaddibu bin deen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, and I'll close with this because we have to pray Aisha. I'll close with this. It's, the, it's a, a statement that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said about Surah Ma'un specifically. He says, Man qara'a Surah Ara'ayta ghafar Allahu lahu in kana lizzakati mu'addiyah 
that whoever recites أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدْعُ عَنْ يَتِينِ Let's recite it. أَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي يُكَذِّبُ بِالدِّينِ فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدْعُ عَنْ يَتِينِ وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينِ فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَابُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَعُونَ Whoever recites these, recites these verses and then follows it up with sadaqah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins. Allah will forgive their sins. So between now and the time that the Iqama is called, every one of you who has a phone that's got access to internet and data, either Islamic Relief or Penny Appeal, give something tonight to an orphan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive your sins and mine inshallah. Let's do that. Can we do that? Can we do that? Hmm? Let's just go, let's just do it now while the, while the Mu'adhan is calling the Adhan. Let's get on our phones. Let's go either to Islamic Relief or to Penny Appeal and, and give some amount of money to an orphan tonight. Inshallah. May Allah accept from you, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.